Hi, this is Nando from CNC Commentaries, and on this episode of CNC Movie Breakdowns, we're going to be talking about the 1987 comedy crime movie Raising Arizona, directed by the Coen Brothers. And I am, of course, joined by my co-host, Chase. And I am, of course, joined by my co-host, Nando. That be me. And that'd be me. So, and here we are. So, Chase, we're going to be talking about uh, Raising Arizona. Yes, we are. This... And uh, I, I picked this movie for us to watch. It had been a while since I've seen it. And, you know, this is this is our first time covering a Coen Brothers movie on the show. Um, you know, we could have started with, um, you know, a bigger one, like the big lebowski or fargo or no country and i'm sure we'll get to all those in the future but i thought you know what why not go with um not go with this one everyone loves seeing uh nicholas cage get up to uh you know hijinks uh yeah nicholas cage is in this movie he's uh he's he's playing he's playing a criminal or a former criminal, I should say. And uh, yes, uh, everybody loves Nicolas Cage. And uh, this uh, this was in 1987, an earlier, an earlier Nicolas Cage movie. Yeah, and an, an early Coen Brothers film. This is only their second film they did, right after Blood Simple. And it's quite the tonal shift from the g- dark and crime-filled world of blood simple to this kind of wacky comedy almost cartoonish film yeah so uh why don't we go into our initial thoughts for this movie uh well, why don't you would you first? would you like to start oh no please you first oh you flatter me um well i hadn't seen this in a in probably about a year um and this, well, this isn't necessarily my favorite Coen Brothers film, or like, might not even make my top five, um, just because the Coen Brothers have so many great films. Um, I just, I just enjoy watching this movie so much because I just find it so much fun with how Nicolas Cage portrays H. I. McDonough and interaction with Holly Hunter and just their chemistry and I just feel like when watching this I feel like you're transported into like a live action cartoon featuring Nicolas Cage and um, I think it's I think it's a lot of fun I don't think the story is as strong as a lot of other Coen Brothers films but I think it shines actually in a lot of its direction uh, yeah, I'm gonna have to agree with you on that kind of cartoony aspect. This uh, definitely has elements of that. Sometimes it's a little over the top, you know, exactly what you'd expect of a of a cartoon. Uh, as for my initial thoughts, eh, I uh, this is my first time seeing this movie. I'm not really an expert on the Coen Brothers. I've only seen a couple of their movies now, and. Uh, I mean, I like how this movie was made technically, but I don't exactly think that this story delivers. I think this movie can be dry in some places. But, Nicholas, I think that this movie is a lot better because it has Nicolas Cage in it. You know, he, he just he makes this movie so much better for me. But, uh, yeah. Uh, I'll give a short synopsis before we uh, dive on in. Oh, I thank you. So, uh, Raising Arizona follows the story of a former criminal, H.I. McDungan. And uh, it follows the story. He uh, marries a policewoman uh, named Ed. And, uh, they, uh, they just try to live a straight life and they try to start a family, but, uh, then they, 
then they realize that they can't have children themselves, so they go to steal a child. And As one does. And, once, and they steal a child from this rich family. And, uh, you know, the, the, the chase after this child is, this, uh, is the story of this movie. And, uh, yeah. Why don't, uh, why don't we dive on in, Chase? All right, let's, uh, let's dive on in. All right, Chase. So, would you, would you like me to do the opening? Sure. Okay, so, right off the bat, um, we are introduced to our main character, um, H.I. Hi, as they say, um, McDonough. And, um, we, uh, get this, these scenes in the intro of kind of just repetition of him, you know, standing at the, the spot where they take your mugshot and him getting his picture taken and, um, Ed, Edwina, um, played by Holly Hunter is the policewoman who is taking his photo and she's like, turn to the right. And, um, we, we keep seeing these back and forth between him getting his mugshot taken and then him getting sent to prison and then being released and then committing another robbery and kind of rinse, wash, repeat. And um, I think it's a really good um, introduction to our main character, H.I. Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. You know, you get the, you get, you get... Uh, these scenes of him he's in prison he goes through the motions of them taking his picture him in a cell and then you go to him getting out of prison he talks to like this little committee who gives him parole and uh, then he commits another another crime another robbery then the whole process starts again as you said and uh, that's just our opening our opening scene but uh, we do get a bit of interaction between Hi and uh, Ed because uh, you have that you have that part where she's taking his picture and then she's crying and Hi asks like oh what's wrong and Ed's like oh my fiance left me and so you get you get kind of the beginnings of their romance. And uh, I think it's definitely, it's definitely an in, a, a good way to introduce our main character, as you said. Yeah, and I, I, I just, I find it, you know, I mean, who's to say what's to happen, but, you know, how just all of a sudden, um, Pi becomes kind of, not obsessed with her, but in the background of his mind, and, you know, later when he goes back another time, because this happens very quickly. Um, you know, he's like, I, I, I was just laying there thinking of Ed and I realized what it was like to, you know, like miss someone while you're on the inside. And then, um, you know, when he's eventually a free man again, he just shows up to the police station and proposes and she says yes. And I mean, I don't know how flattered she was by, um, eight, by, um, Hi, saying he'd like, you know, you give me his name, that son of a bitch who did this to you. But uh, hey, she's she's into it and she wants to marry him. Yeah. And so they get married, and we see that they live out in like this little trailer area. And you see that uh, Hi has mostly, for the most part, gone straight. He's even got a job. Yeah. And uh, you know. I and Ed are just, uh, they're just relaxing at home, and they're, they're trying to start a family. And but then, of course, uh, this wouldn't be a story unless they had their highs and lows. Yeah. So, uh, it's eventually found out that, uh, Ed can't have kids, she's infertile, and, you know, this, this obviously devastates her. She's barren. Yeah. And so she's like, oh no, we need, we need to have kids. So they try to do adoption, but uh, 
adoption doesn't ends up not working because uh, high has a criminal record so yeah and uh, there's this great line that I love where they're at the adoption agency and then you know he's looking at high's record and he's like oh you're a criminal and then he's like well uh yeah but she's an officer of the law you know two times decorated so uh we think it kind of balances out yeah <laughs> um and i just i think that's a really good line and that's and that's one of the main things i love about the coen brothers and their witty dialogue uh yeah but uh then we then we continue on and you see that you know hi and ed are are are, are down because they can't have kids and, you know Ed loses interest in her job and and housework, and hi, uh, he he catches himself driving by convenience stores that weren't on the yeah. way home from his job, like he's staking them out for robbery. Yeah, he's kind of. I feel like he's kind of like missing that thrill of robbing convenience stores, gas stations, whatnot. Yeah. Because uh, that's kind of like all he's known, and this new like home life that he's getting into isn't what he's used to. Yeah, but so Hi and Ed are just uh, they're sitting on the couch and watching some TV, and then a story comes up on the TV about uh, unpainted Arizona, and it's this uh, this is it's this unpainted furniture like commercial. But then it says that the owner of the store and his wife had how many babies? Five. Five. Quintuplets. Quintuplets. So they just had quintuplets. And uh, so Ed's like, oh, they have, they have, they have too many to handle. They're, they have too many babies. And we, we don't, there's this really good line. It's like, oh. It's not really fair that some people have too much while others have none, or others have few. And uh, so they decide to go and uh, take one of their babies, and that's why the, t the that's where the movie gets its name, Raising Arizona. Yeah. Raising an Arizona baby. Yep. The Arizona children. Yes. And, uh, well, um, so uh, we get this scene where um, I and Ed are kind of like waiting outside of the Arizona house, and then um, Hi climbs through the window and into the the, the baby's room, and then uh, we see uh, you know the crib with all of them, and it's like you know Harry and Barry and Gary and Larry. Than Nathan Jr. Yeah, all of them rhyme except Nathan Jr. He got singled oh. out for some reason. Um, but we get this, you know, this this funny scene of um, of Hyde just trying to wrangle the babies because they're getting out, and he's trying to figure out, you know, which one he wants to take, and then like. They try and, like, leave the room, and, you know, he's got to grab the kid before he falls down the stairs, and he's just, like... You know, I feel like this is almost more frightening for him than, like, having to deal with cops. Yeah, he, we can definitely tell he's out of his element. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, definitely, it's, it's a comedic scene where, you know, Nicolas Cage is trying to wrangle up some babies... But eventually, you know, he kind of he he wrangles them up. He puts them in his cr in their crib, and then he goes back out to Ed, who and he's like, "I can't do it." And then Ed's like, "Oh, you you better go and do it. You know, we're not leaving without a baby." And uh, so Nic Nicholas Cage goes back in, and uh, he grabs a baby. He grabs Nathan. Or <laughs> uh, he grabs Junior. Nathan Jr. Nathan Jr. And so now they have a baby. I just want to say I love how the the camera is used in this scene and throughout the whole movie but like 
there'll be like you know shots of high from above from like the baby's perspective or like of him crawling under the crib and going after the kid and you know that scene where he's like under the crib it's like kind of replicated later where he's getting dragged out from under by the biker yeah i just feel like the way the camera is moved in this movie and used is very well done uh yeah so uh then they take it they take the baby home and uh you know they they have a little celebration set up like there's even like little le- letters hanging off the ceiling it's welcome home son and uh so you know they're re- they're obviously really happy ed has like fallen in love with the baby and they seem like they're having a jolly old time and so the jolliest and uh they decide to take a picture and you know while they're trying to take this picture ed is asking hi all these questions like oh uh are you going to you're going to help out like you're going to you're going to be responsible right and of course i was like oh yeah of course i will always well you you can tell how nervous he is from this scene and you know i feel like the like the ticking on the like the self timer of the camera is like like representative of like what's going on with him yeah for sure and, like you know and then he, he's like you know he's in barely focused really and then you know that of course the photo comes out all yeah. you know not as they would have liked yeah it comes out like high is like nervously smiling and, well, and his just... hair is all over the place. He looks like he's sweating bullets. And Ed's just talking to him, not even looking at the camera. And uh, so after this picture, we get introduced to two more characters. Uh, they yeah. come out of the ground. Yeah. Okay. Like so zombies. The the snoot the snoot brothers. Yeah. Gale and Evil. So Gale and Evil, they're two brothers. And uh, yeah. so the way they're introduced is uh, very interesting as they uh, they like it's it's like raining hard so they kind of like rise out of the muddy ground. And yeah, I remember like, uh, zombies. Yeah, exactly. Well, the first time I watched this, I was so confused. I was like, "Are, are there zombies in this? What's going on?" And then um, you know, we find out later. You know, there's a a manhole in the ground and they just came out and they dug up yeah which and... well, it had to be a hell of a lot of work yeah like especially in the, the the rain and all that mud yeah so they they come out they're covered in mud and uh you know it's a it's like raining hard and there's thundering going on but i guess they make their way to some sort of like gas station and they manage to uh fix their hair and they steal a car and you should say that I should say that they're played by um, great John Goodman and William Forsythe. You know, this is the first of many collaborations between John Goodman and the Coen Brothers. So I think that's a pretty neat thing. Uh, right. So they ha- they now have a stolen car. Uh, Hi and Ed now have the stolen baby. What happens next, Chase? Okay, well, so after the, uh, after they, you know, come out of the mud and they kind of, like, brush up in that gas station, you know, do their hair, they, they specifically focus on that they left a little pom- pomade can in there. Yeah. And so, I, you know, I think it's obvious, like, we know that that's going to come back later. Um, but then they, so we cut back to, um, you know, Hi and Ed at home. And you know they're like, well, uh, we did it. We're gonna do. We're gonna raise a family. Yet it's, it's, it's gonna happen. And then um, they hear a knock on the door, and um, we hear a voice, and it's like, open up, police. And you know, um, high of course is, you know, he's like, don't worry about it. I'll deal with it. And, you know, he pulls out a gun just to be safe. And then um, from like the back, we hear we hear like them start chuckling, and it's like. Oh, you know, we had you fooled. 
and so it's the two uh, the two Snotes brothers, and they show up, and we quickly realize that they all knew each other in prison. Yeah. So uh, they're so it's established like they're laughing together. High and uh, the two brothers were friends in prison, and High's like, "Oh, these two fellows were were they're my friends from prison." And uh, Ed is looking at them, and Ed sees, and Ed's holding the baby, and Ed is seeing like, how like, oh, how like filthy they are. They're covered in mud. Pretty much the only clean part about them is their hair. And she's they're barely. <laughs> yeah. And she's like, oh. You guys can catch up, but uh, you, you can't stay here. Yeah, she she's already kind of looking out and not wanting any bad influences around uh, the baby. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, uh, you kind of get this... Uh, she's almost like passive-aggressive towards them. She's like, oh, you can catch up, but you got to clear out by morning and things like that. And uh, so I really like the dynamic between the brothers because uh, Gail, he speaks um, with almost like an intelligent vocabulary. And uh, his brother is kind of just normal, but uh, they're definitely both criminals, you can tell. Well, I mean, because they they mean they just got out. (laughs) Yeah, and it's revealed here that they tunneled out of prison. But the way okay. the way Gail frames it is he didn't he doesn't say they break out he says oh we left because we feel that the institution had nothing left to offer. Yeah, that's another great line. Yeah. And uh, so, Hi and Ed are like talking and and Ed's like oh we can't have them here, and then Hi is like oh don't worry. Just for tonight and tomorrow tops. Yeah, because he kind of feels like, you know, you know, he's known them for a while and he just feels like, you know, they just got out, give they, them... They got nowhere to go. Yeah, yeah we'll kind of just like, you know, just give them today. Yeah. And uh, so, he, uh, so, High goes to bed. And he has, uh, he has quite a nightmare. Yes. And uh, that's when we're introduced to the biker. Dun dun dun. So he has a nightmare about this this biker who's riding a Harley. He looks really dirty and he's armed to the teeth. He's got yeah. grenades on his vest. He's got two Ooh. shotguns on his back. He's basically like a hellish figure. He's got literal flames coming off of his bike. Yeah. Some would say reminiscent of a ghost rider yeah I, when we were watching this movie i was like is this a ghost rider is this foreshadowing um, for Nicolas cage um you know but we're introduced to this guy and uh, this character and we have no idea who he is he you just know looks he's, evil <laughs> he's freaking blowing up rabbits yeah he sees a rabbit on the side of the road he just grabs a grenade and throws it at the rabbit he just you blows know, up a rabbit for no kind reason of the, kind of the kind of a waste of a perfectly good grenade but and then he shoots a lizard off of a rock. Yeah, so he's just, you know, no regard for anything. You know, he's driving by, and I think like there's no like a flower catches on fire. Yeah, so and it's just like, like life is literally catching on fire due to the presence of this man. You know, and he's just. Uh, and so, you know, High wakes up eventually to his wife talking to the baby. And, uh, you know, they get to talking, and then we get to the breakfast scene. Well, we get this, you know, there's this scene, yeah, we find out, you know, and there's this cool shot where, like, the camera, like, goes up a ladder and into the the, the baby's room, and um, Miss Arizona is, like, screaming. Wow. All right, uh, so once, uh, once... Once High wakes up, uh, before the breakfast scene, there's uh, the press is outside Mr. Arizona's house because it's now been discovered that his uh, his kid's gone missing. Yeah. 
So uh, one thing about Mr. Arizona is that he always talks like he's on TV. Well, I mean, I feel like that personality is just him. Yeah. He, he, he always acts as if he's on TV. Like, even when, dis, when, even when dis, discussing his son's, like, kidnapping or disappearance, he's like, Oh, and don't worry, business is as usual. Or else my name isn't... Uh, isn't. My name isn't Nathan Arizona. Yeah, my name isn't Nathan Arizona. And uh, so he's talking to the cops and the FBI has gotten involved in this case. And uh, the cops and the FBI are like talking over each other to try to question Mr. Arizona. And uh, there's just a really cool shot of Mr. Arizona sitting down in the middle of the, in the, middle of the shot. Well, on his uh, left, there are FBI guys in uh, dark suits. And on his right, there's a policeman in a police uniform. It's just a cool shot I wanted to mention. And uh, so they're questioning him and they're asking him, oh, could it be an employee? Do you know of anyone who it could have been? And he's like, oh, no, I don't know. You know, because he really doesn't know anything. He's just kind of waiting for leads. Yeah, and he's kind of there's there's another really good line where he's like, "Why you don't have any leads?" And he's like, "You know, you know, put my foot in a hole in the ground." And then it cuts to the biker riding up to the hole where um, the two brothers had escaped from. Uh, yeah, that's the thing. You know, uh, when I was first watching the scene, the cops around the hole don't really acknowledge this armed biker that kind of came up to them. So I was like, is this guy like a ghost or something? You know, I was a little bit confused. Yeah, he's sort of just like, not an agent of chaos, but he's like, he's got like this odd feeling where he doesn't feel real. He just feels ma ma like a manifestation of sorts. Yeah. And yeah. I feel like in a sense, he's kind of like, you know, we'll get into this at the end, but I feel like he's representative of parts of high yeah uh so then we uh we get this uh breakfast scene between high ed and the two brothers and uh so ed and the brothers are just being passive aggressive towards each other you know just kind of taking jabs at each other and uh so kind of like that sometimes and so ed <laughs> Ed's like, oh yeah, you guys, you you guys need to like leave soon. And uh, so you know, High gets involved, and he's like, oh, uh, would you would you boys mind clearing out for a couple hours later? And you see that High is kind of like stuck in between his wife and uh, his friends from jail, because he never outright says that he wants to kick them out. He just kind of gets them out he just wants to get them out of the house for a little bit and it's just an interesting uh, dynamic between everybody yeah you can definitely tell high is in between two different um facets facets of life between his old prison life and this new um suburban lifestyle he's trying to maintain yeah he's not exactly ready for family life yeah, uh, and that's kind of the that's kind of uh, one of the points of the movie. Yeah, yeah, I feel like he's he's just trying to make Ed happy, and and we kind of see that when um, Dot and Glenn show up and they they bring all their kids, and um, you know, um, High and Glenn have these you know talks face to face, but we kind of see in High's eyes as he's watching all these kids you know run around and sort of cause mischief, you know. Like he's kind of intimidated and scared by this, you know. He's he's not used to this this type of lifestyle. Uh yeah, for sure. I like, I yeah, it's definitely pretty obvious in this uh, movie. You know, High never really moves on from his crime past. It just feels like he's never really ready ready to settle down. He's just caught off guard. Well, I, he's used to that repetition of you know uh, robbing somewhere, getting taken to jail, coming out rinse wash repeat and so you know for the better he's trying to break that but also i feel like if anything this this scares him more yeah than 
a potential robbery. He's definitely going to unknown territory. Yeah, especially because he just wants what's best. Yeah. And uh, so Glenn and High are just talking, and throughout this like whole scene, you see that Glenn and Dot's kids are just running around. They're just being obnoxious. They're banging on stuff. And they're just running around, and yeah, High looks at this, and he's like, I'm not ready for this. This is too much. Yeah, and we, we find that Glenn is also, you know, uh, kind of racist <laughs> with uh, some of the jokes he's saying. And uh, he, yeah. He, and he's not even, he's, he, he keeps, you know, stumbling over his words, kind of like I just did. Um, and it's just, you can tell that High is just, feels very weirded out by glenn yeah it's definitely kind of uncomfortable <laughs> yeah he and, just, uh, uh, just just doesn't understand glenn very much and uh so, I... so you know they keep talking and uh more you know glenn keeps making these jokes that he stumbles over that he has to repeat and high is just not having it dude <laughs> yeah and you know uh, we see them you know eating outside you know making like sandwiches or whatever and you know dot brings up she's like oh you know do, do you have a doctor for the baby or you know have you taken him to get his shots and then they're like you know dot's kind of just like con uh continuing to make ed more nervous and like you know we got to get this we got to get that for the baby yeah. and i just has this blank expression like yeah yeah okay yeah so do you see dot just kind of like yeah she as you said she's kind of making them more nervous especially like ed like she's like oh you got to open up a bank account for him you got to get his shots just all these things and then ed's like hi we've got to do these things and she's just kind of rushing him it's definitely he he definitely feels rushed and he kind of it kind of when we see him walking with glenn he kind of expresses this well, yeah, and then Glenn is like, you know, because Glenn and Dot, well, we don't know how long they've been married, but it's obviously they've been together a while and have a lot of kids. And he's like, you know, if you ever get bored of the same old thing, you know, he kind of like prepositions them, prop propositions them to like, you know, the four of them, you know, together. Yeah. And High doesn't like that at all, and he gets really mad, you know, he punches Glenn and you know just scares him off yeah and glenn's like you know glenn just he, glenn the main word i'd choose to describe him is just ignorance yeah he just kind of he can't really read social cues he just kind of yeah goes. yeah he can't read the room yeah so yeah after you know glenn he tells how he's like oh my wife and i are swingers he gets punched in the face and then he runs off and... You know, you know, we see that kind of stuff later with like him not being able to read the room where he goes and tells the joke to a certain cop. Yeah. And then gets arrested. So. Uh, and we cut to later at night. Hi and Ed are in the car and they're driving, and they're kind of, they're arguing back and forth. Ed's like, "Oh, you shouldn't have broken his nose," and you definitely this is uh you know at this point in the movie they haven't really disagreed other than kicking the brothers out yeah but uh here you really get i don't know you really get to see the cracks in their relationship yeah you you know it's not a perfect relationship by any means especially with we see how the unconventional start of the relationship yeah and the unconventional paths that it's taken this isn't normal by any means and so you know hi drives them to a convenience store and uh he's looking he's looking to buy some diapers for the baby but it turns out he has other plans in mind because yeah. uh he grabs the pampers uh what does he use for a mask uh like pantyhose yeah yeah. And it's, it's it's one of my favorite lines, you know, one of my favorite Coen Brothers lines in general. It's just like, "Boy, you got a panty on your head." Yeah. And it, this is I this is one of the best scenes in the movie. This chase scene, and he's like jumping through people's backyards and houses, and 
going through convenience stores and it's how the camera is zigzagging around yeah you know like we said earlier it's very much like a cartoon in terms of like the outlandishness of it yeah for sure um so yeah he so hi pulls out his gun he has the pampers he has the penny on his face he uh he robs the convenience store and ed actually sees him through the window he's like making the uh, making the cashier give him all the money and uh she she takes this car and she drives away she leaves him well yeah she just wants to look out for junior yeah and so yeah again that chase happens yeah he drops the pampers in the middle of the street he runs through people's yards it's definitely cartoonish yeah he, he knocks a dog's like chain on loose and the dog starts chasing after him which yeah. there's just something about dogs in movies that make them very persistent and want to chase people for some reason yeah and, uh, <laughs> and eventually he, he like pulls over this random guy and makes him drive yeah and then they, they run back into you know ed driving and he tries to get her attention to slow down yeah but meanwhile this guy's he's all scared he's like and then the can the it's this great shot the convenience store boy with his gun holding it to the car yeah just unrelenting like this every like the sooner it's almost like a video game like sure yeah. this this can <laughs> rent theft auto esque yeah this convenience store boy like this guy that's getting paid like minimum wage leaves the store with what like a shotgun and c chases this robber down <laughs> it's just like how he's how he looks you know he, he reminds me very much of like the squeaky voice teen from uh, the simpsons like that kind of demeanor like pimples on the face yeah like, he doesn't he doesn't seem like the kind of man to just uh chase down an armed robber yeah yeah and then you know the police start chasing him through this house and the, there's like kids watching tv you don't even realize you know yeah. he's just popping through and then their dog starts to chase him I mean, the police don't even say anything when they're going through that house. No. They're just like... It. Which also, that's another thing. Lock your damn doors. Yeah. I mean, if this door had been locked, this movie would have been over. <laughs> this movie. Like, I would have yeah. just gotten arrested. <laughs> I, and, then, like, the dogs follow the same exact path. They somehow know where High is going. Yeah, and eventually he he continues to run and he makes it into this like grocery store and uh so he continues running and the the cops are chasing him and now he has like i don't know how many like at over 10 dogs chasing him yeah it's just it's purposely absurd yeah and then uh, the grocery store cashier pulls out a shotgun and starts shooting it high as well it's just you know and then the he, he, he gets in that grocery store and then he goes down like the like cosmetics or like you know a dial and there's like tons of diapers but he specifically is grabs huggies yeah because he you know and that's why there's been huggies throughout this whole movie because he saw huggies in the you know the 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 room when they stole the kid yeah from the arizona's house there were huggies in there he's just like well if that's what they have i might as well get it you know yeah like he could he could save time by just grabbing any diapers, but he specifically looks for huggies. It shows that he doesn't really know what he's doing. Like, he's just going with the status quo. Like, oh, if they had it, I have to have it. Eh, not, not necessarily that. It's just like, you know, this is what he has. Might as well get it again. I don't know. It's, yeah, it shows, you know, he doesn't know a lot, but um. I know a lot in terms of uh, parenting. Yeah, and so eventually Ed's, Ed turns around and she eventually picks up High. So she came back for him. And, uh, you know, the sooner he gets back in the car, they're, they're arguing. Ed's like, what are you doing? How could you do this? And while they're arguing, I really like this because while they're arguing, uh, you know, throughout them, like, yelling at each other, he's telling her directions of where to go. Mm -hmm. and eventually he finds in the same street that like he originally started he finds the diapers that he dropped and he just yeah. opens his car window grabs them and then they speed off all comes full circle <laughs> it all comes full circle and uh then we cut back to the brothers 
at at the at the at their house. Their yeah, and they're they're practically just you know they were watching TV earlier. They're covered in beer cans and food and whatnot, and they're just you know they've taken the kin to just sustain in this house. You know, it's very clear they don't want to go anywhere. Yeah, they're kind of just high, is, high now is very much like no, you you guys gotta leave. Yeah, and Ed's, Ed's especially confrontational about it. She's like, tomorrow I'm going uh, with the baby to get... So she's. I think she's going to get the baby vaccinated. And uh, you, by the time I'm back, you boys better be gone. And, you know, the boys... Or the brothers are kind of almost apologetic about it. Especially the more intelligent one. Like, he's just like, oh, I'm sorry. We didn't mean to be a bad influence. Or something like that. And, uh, so, the brothers and Hyde get to talking. And, uh, why don't you tell us what the brothers have concocted? Well, so they've come up with a plan that they're like, we're gonna, we're gonna go rob some banks. They want to go on a heist spree. Yeah, and they want Hyde's help. Yeah. And they're like... And Hyde's like, well, I don't know, this is pretty risky. And they're like, you know, he's like, what if we got caught? And he's like, well, if we do it right, uh, we won't get caught. And if we do get caught, well, he's like, if it's a success and we get the money, we're set for life. And if we get caught and sent to prison, we are set for life. Yeah, it's definitely and that's, the, that's a really gray line. Definitely the one last job, almost cliche. Well, they kind of they kind of talk how they want to just go from place to place, continuing robbing. Yeah. Uh, so high eventually, he decides to go with it. And uh, one of I think one of the one of my favorite scenes in the movie is uh, high writing this letter to Ed. And as yeah. he's writing this letter, uh, we get this scene of the biker. Uh, he's driving his motorcycle on like a uh, on a dark road while High is writing this le- the letter, yeah. and it's definitely symbolic of High's you know his the way his actions are turning darker. I mean, we see the the biker go into the the furniture store and um, talk with Nathan Arizona. Yeah, and then he's kind of so he he goes into nathan arizona's office and he's just like he's basically negotiating with him and being like oh i could get you back your kid and uh nathan arizona is like he's not having any of it he thinks that the biker probably stole him or something and the biker's basically you know exploiting him kind of to get more money yeah the biker's basically, he sits him down and he's like, oh, sure, I can track your baby, but I want more money. And then yeah. Nathan Arizona's like, well, I'm not going to pay you anything but the reward. Yeah, he's like, he's talking about how much he could get for a baby on the black market. Or... Yeah. So Nathan Arizona... You know, Arizona... He's, he's just like, I'm a good tracker. I can track down this guy. Yeah. So, basically... The biker gave him an ultimatum. He's like, either you pay me more to get the baby, or I sell the baby on the black market. And you know, and if this guy barged into my office, I'd, I'd be scared shitless. Yeah, this guy is this like greasy, dirty-looking biker man with grenades on his vest, two shotguns. He's definitely yeah. I mean, that's what's what's so great about him, you know? Like, he's never introduced by name necessarily. No, he just he's shows just... up. Or he's just foreboding, intimidating, like dark aura almost. One could say both ominous and foreboding. Yes. And, and <laughs> so now the biker is giving him this ultimatum, and uh, it's morning now. And so hi, hi, get a visit from Glenn. Mm-hmm. And. Glenn's basically given high an ear for it. He has like a bandage on his nose, you know, his, yeah, his he's nose got, got a, broken. Yeah, like a neck brace. Yeah. 
and he's like, first of all, you're fired. So Hyatt's lost his job. And, and he's like, I know where that baby came from. Yeah. So now he know the jig is up about the baby, and but he does he he doesn't say he's gonna turn him in to the police. He says, "Well, my wife Dot wants another baby, so you've got twenty four hours to say goodbye." I'll, or sorry, he says, "I'll give you till sundown to say goodbye, but I'll come back with the baby, or I'll come back and you'll give us the baby." Yeah. And he also he also says that High's gonna pay his doctor bill. <laughs> it's just Which, like, I mean, I guess that's better in terms for High that rather than him going to the police. Well, I mean, I but guess. I, I I I High would always end up beating Glenn's ass in a fight. Yeah, Glenn's kind of meek. He's he's weaselly and just like I said, he never knows the right stuff to say and just I see it feels like would always get himself into more trouble yeah and it turns out that the brothers heard this exchange yep and uh, now the brothers have the baby because they know that the baby is worth money yeah and so hi and uh, one of the brothers they get into a little a little a little scuffle Yep, him and Gail. Him and Gail get into a bit of a bit of a romp, you know. You know, it kind of gets almost like WWE because yeah, <laughs> their fight is really extra. I mean, like Gail's punching through the walls and things like that. Yeah, he like grabs a like a board and starts hitting High on the head. Yeah, but High grabs his nose and is like, <laughs> and I love the cut to um the other brother with the baby he's just sitting on the bathtub with Junior. <laughs> yeah he's just covering the baby's ears making yeah. sure that he doesn't hear anything but eventually it and it, re it reminds me of the the wrestling scene in Barton Fink which John Goodman and the Coen brothers would collaborate on so it's kind of like a like a prelude to that almost yeah but eventually High loses this fight when uh, Gail throws him through the bathroom wall. Because, of course. <laughs> yeah, he just throws him through a wall. But uh, they tie High up, and uh, they leave him there. They take they take Nathan Jr., and they leave High there to struggle. And, yeah, but eventually, you know, after struggling a lot, High just kind of fades into unconsciousness. But, uh... I mean, you could feel the, like, the tension, you could feel the nervousness and tension from Nicolas Cage. Yeah. Nicolas Cage. And I, you know, a lot of people give Nicolas Cage a bad rap. But I, think... I feel, he, he does, he, he's the best part of this movie. He is the best part of this movie. Bar none. And he, you know, I think this is one of his best performances. Uh, yeah, I think people do give Nicolas Cage a bad rap, but I don't think he's a bad actor. I just kind of think that sometimes he gets bad movies <laughs> well he's got a very unique approach to things yeah but i think it's you know it's clear that he can do he can good. do well yeah uh but eventually ed gets home and you get this uh, you get this really cool scene of uh so Pi is arming up He's uh he's got a t he's got like three pistols and a shotgun. He's arming up for war, and Ed's just sitting in this chair, just completely silent. And of course, High is telling him like, "Oh, we're gonna get that baby back, and after we get back, I'm going straight. I was wrong. You were right." Yeah, yeah my favorite part about this in mean, the whole movie even is his hair. Yeah, his hair is always just so like loofed up and like out of control on like hey, they like it like it conveys like his stress almost yeah uh then we cut to the brothers they're in this car with junior and you know they're just talking to junior and you can feel like they're kind of getting attached to junior yeah like yeah they're definitely being getting attached to junior you know they're just talking with him they're they're telling they're just like basically joking around with him and it's 
it's almost like a very nice scene because you especially the uh brother that isn't gale he's the one holding him he's like giving him hugs he's giving him affection yeah you can tell that they're he's the more caring of the two yeah. and um gale's more like brute mm -hmm. but eventually they stop at a convenience store and uh you know the more caring brother he goes in he gets diapers and there's these really funny interactions between this old cashier and this brother mm -hmm. you know <laughs> he's getting he's getting diapers and he gets like balloons because he's like oh do these blow up in funny shapes and, and the old man's like oh if you find circles funny and it's just these like witty interactions yeah i mean the coens are so good with like those little kinds of lines and quips from just like one scene characters that make them memorable and in other ways that i think would be like a pretty forgettable scene you know yeah uh but yeah this uh the brother he uh he pulls a gun out and he he uh he steals the you know his groceries and you know then they're back in the car the brothers and uh they start to notice that the <laughs> <laughs> the junior is gone and so you get this really funny scene of them just uh screaming at each other because they realize that they left uh the baby behind well you gotta remember they placed the 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 baby carriage on the top of the car <laughs> yeah and so they're just scared that they might have just driven with him on the car but then they stop and they look and they realize he's not there and so they they just continue screaming at each other and they just immediately turn around and just zoom back yeah because they're like well first off this is, could be a potential we might have just killed a child <laughs> and then they were also getting close to it and also maybe a they might have wanted the reward yeah but we see that the baby is fine in the middle of the road he's just kind of relaxing there and uh so they drive back and they uh they reclaim the child and as they uh as they <laughs> as they're taking him in i think something that's really funny is is when they have him again they're like oh uh we're never going to let you go we're, you're gonna be with us forever you know mm -hmm. it's just they're they're just unwilling to let him go now yeah it's, I mean, that baby's luck to be able to just sit there in the middle of the street. Which, I, who knows how busy that street is, but... Yeah. That's that's a scary thing. But, after that, uh, we cut to Ed and Hi, and they're in the car, and Ed's just being kind of silent, and Hi's apologizing. And Ed's kind of tearing up. And she's like, we're going to get this baby back, and then we're done, basically. Mm -hmm. She tells him that, you know, she still loves him, but she just thinks that he's not ready for this life. That they can't be together like this. And I, I think it's important to mention that she's she's in her uniform, her police uniform. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I think the costuming is pretty good in this movie. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Like, especially Nicolas Cage with that, like, kind of, like, tropical shirt. Yeah, he's got, like, a Hawaiian shirt on. <laughs> and it's just, like, it's so Nicolas Cage and so... It's just casual, almost. Yeah. I mean, he might have all these guns, but he's not really dressed for war. He looks like somebody's dad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so... You know, there they're going back and forth you know ed's telling him like oh you know we're pretty much done and uh then we cut back to the biker who's arrived at the at ed high's house which is now like trashed due to the their fight mm -hmm. and uh you know it's not really explained how the biker finds them like it's not really explained how he tracks the baby back to their house but he just shows up 
and uh, he he grabs a little piece of newspaper off the ground, and this it shows a picture of the bank that the brothers were planning to rob with high. Yeah. And he's like, oh, so it's uh, they're going to rob the bank. He he goes over there. He does. Well, the brothers get there first, and uh, walk us through this robbery scene, Jace. Okay, so, you know, they're in the bank, and, um, you know, they're getting the bags of money, and then they're also, as it's happening, they get, like, what, 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 what is that thing called that's filled with the ink? I don't know, but it's like, well, a, little, it's like a little bomb. Well, yeah, and they have it sometimes on, like, items, you know, if you steal them, it'll go off and explodes, right? Yeah. So, but he doesn't know any better. So he puts that in the bag with the money. Mm-hmm. And then they go, and then they drive off. You know, they have the money in the bags, but they also have that. And so they're driving along, and then... And they're also... It explodes, first yeah. off. And then they also realize that they forgot the baby again. Yeah. After them saying, you know, we're not going to let him out of our sight. Yeah. So uh, these guys aren't very responsible. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't... I don't <laughs> think you'd ever list them as a responsible type. Yeah. But, you know, the the ink explodes all over their car. You know, they're surrounded in blue ink. Then they get pulled, you know... High and Ed show up, open the doors, and they're basically like, you know, where is he? You know, they take the the like the baby manual that we've seen throughout, and they just grab that and they kind of like you know hit him around and they're like, what the hell? How did you forget the kid? Yeah. And so, and so they get back in their car. And uh, another a funny thing is that the brothers just start running after them. They just kind of ditch the car. <laughs> I mean, they're already covered in ink. Might as well drive the car. Uh, yeah. And uh, so th- we find out that the baby is again in the middle of the road. And uh, we see one of the bikers' grenades go off. Like, it, that's how we kind of know that he's in the vicinity. That's how. <laughs> Yeah. They'll just throw grenades at things that are like wild animals. Yeah. And then we get this great shot of him driving up to the ba- the baby and picking the baby up in the same way that Hai picked up the Huggies from the car. Yeah. And so I think this is like another way that shows like the par- the parallels between Hai and the biker. Yeah. And how like Hai could almost like, this could be Hai if he went down a darker path. Uh, but uh, the biker also throws a grenade in Hyde and Ed's car, so they have to bail on the car, so they dive out. Yeah. You know, he, he lets out like a, a howl, and you know, does like a wheelie over to High. Yeah. And basically, it's the time for their final confrontation of sorts. Yeah. And uh, so Ed grabs he grabs the grabs the child and starts to run, uh, but. Hi and the biker have their final confrontation. And, uh, you know, once they get to a fight, you know, the biker whips out, like, a chain, and he grabs High's weapon. You know, and he, then he just pulls him in, and he starts beating him. And, you know, he just... I just really doesn't stand a chance against this guy. But eventually, I manages to pull the the pin on a grenade on one of uh, on a grenade on the biker's chest and mm-hmm. you know I, while I was watching this movie I kind of thought that like why would this guy ride around with grenades on his chest like that's kind of that's that's kind of really dangerous but yeah the I, don't, bike, I don't think this guy cares too much about this guy's middle name potential is danger to others <laughs> uh, but then the biker gets blown up and uh, that is the end of the biker. You know, you even see, like, uh, a piece of his vest that comes down. You know, this guy just got obliterated. I mean, it was, it was bound to happen at some point. Bound to happen. You know, and why don't you, why don't you walk us to the next part? 
the this, this end scene where they return Junior. So, Ed and Hi eventually go back to the Arizona residence, and they return the baby. And, you know, they put him, all his siblings are gone. Like, they're just not there. But then, uh, Nathan, Arizona walks in, and he's like, who the hell are you guys? But then they see that he's returned the baby. And they're, and eventually he's like oh thank you so much for returning them or returning the baby but eventually he figures out that they were the ones that originally took it so you know i I love how he's just doesn't care he's just like flailing a gun around in a toddler's room yeah (laughs) he like he goes to grab nathan jr and he's like He's got the gun in one hand and the baby in the other, and he's, like, swapping it out, putting the gun in the crib. Yeah. And, uh, so, you know, eventually, Nathan Arizona almost comes to, like, forgive him, or forgive them. I don't know exactly, but, you know, they're talking about, and they tell Nathan Arizona that they're pretty, like, their relationship is over, and he's like, oh, I don't know, you guys should just sleep on it, see how you guys feel in the morning. You know, they're just, uh, and he lets them go. He's like, oh, go go out the way you came. That's just a very nice scene. And uh, I think uh, I think it's interesting, considering that Nathan Arizona has kind of been, in, like, previous scenes of the movie, he's kind of been shown as, like, a jerk. Yeah, kind of like an uncaring and, like, not even, like, focused more on, like, his commercial image than his family life yeah but uh he he kind of you know it it shows kind of like a lighter side to him in this scene and uh yeah that's that's something that's something nice like like we know throughout the whole movie that obviously he cares for his kid but he it seemed like he's more focused on his own image rather than family but it it grounds him more yeah. as a loving figure and uh then oh, excuse me uh then we get uh we get an interesting scene uh we see high is in bed you know him and ed and are, or, or him and ed are in bed and uh he has a dream and he has a dream of like him and Ed getting kind of older together, and that they have this huge family that that is all connected, uh, and he just he just has a really nice dream about a potential future where him and Ed have a big family, and yeah. everybody's happy together. It's just a sweet note to end on. Of course, this probably doesn't come to light, but yeah, that's uh, the thing. He's like, I don't know if it was real. But oh, it seemed so real. Yeah. And so it's kind of like it puts him at a peace of mind and, and hope. Give... Yeah, it definitely gives him uh, hope. Should we move on to our our final thoughts, our closing thoughts? Ah, uh, yeah, let's do that. So, uh, would you like to start? Uh, sure. Well, for this movie, I don't think anything was necessarily bad. I don't think, I think the direction, the acting, I think everything was actually pretty good, except for maybe the story. I mean, the story just, in my opinion, just kind of gets really boring at some parts. Like, it's just, uh... I don't know. I just got bored during this movie, but it's probably just a personal thing. I don't know. This just isn't the story for me. A, a story about a man and his wife trying to find their child who keeps getting stolen. I don't know. It just, it just kind of. I just kind of lost interest halfway through the movie. But technically, I don't think this movie is bad at all. Like I think this movie was made pretty well, and it's got some really funny moments. I think the Coen brothers are good at witty dialogue. Uh, so, those are my final thoughts. What about yours, Chase? Well, overall, um, like I said at the top of this, um, this isn't, you know, 
my favorite Coen Brothers film. This isn't, I don't think this is their technical best. I don't think this is their funniest. You know, I wouldn't, I don't even know if this would make my top five. But it's so cartoony and outlandish. And Nicolas Cage does such a good job of being this character of H.I. McDonough and bringing the, the foolish and the heart to the role. And um, I think because of that, it's very memorable and it has a lot of great moments. And uh, I, I enjoy revisiting it occasionally. Uh, I think it's a, it's a nice, simple story. It's not trying to do anything too complex. And it's, it's just nice. Uh, yeah. And uh, with that, why don't we go into our ratings? Okay. I will give this film a solid 7.5 out of 10. And uh, I'll give this film a... I'll give this film a 6 out of 10. Not the best, but not the worst. Uh, and with that, I think that, uh, that, that that concludes it. Wait a minute. We must do a tease. Uh, yes. Why? Uh, I, get, I guess I'll do that one. Yeah. Well, well, well. We've reached the end of another episode, and with that, we must do a tease. Next time on the show, we will be talking about... Uh, Jim Carrey film and um, it is going to be The Truman Show uh, this one's going to be special Chase um, and very very special for the first time we will be having a special guest mm -hmm. so be excited for that get ready to tune in uh, it's going to be nice to have a, another person to talk to because I already get sick of your voice as is <laughs> uh, but we are going to be talking about the Truman Show and that is going to be a lot of fun I'm sure yeah um, well then goodbye everyone <laughs>